So we're going on YouTube. So you're up now. Okay, we'll just wait for it to finish uh, setting up the screen. Then we should be good to go. Okay. Uh, all right. So we're going on. All right. So um, welcome back, everyone. It's now one o'clock and time for our reading group. Um, so today uh, we are going to be looking at synthetic data generation uh, for um, machine reading comprehension. Okay, so uh, as usual, uh, this uh, session will be recorded. So, um, you know, you can turn off your camera if you don't want to be recorded. But uh, of course, I do appreciate if uh, you uh, can stream so that uh, we can uh, have the presenters actually see who they're talking to. It's always difficult uh, without that. Okay, so um, I'm going to check again who we have um, uh, to do the presentation today. And if our scribe team is ready, um, they should have a document uh, set up to do that, okay? So uh, before we start with the presentations, I, I just want to uh, say a couple words here. It's now week seven, so that means it's the last week for those students in 6101 for the previous rotation. And that means from week eight onwards, we'll have a new set of students from uh, the uh, first year PhD student batch joining us for the second half, okay? Um, it also happens to be the week that uh, projects are, are really getting underway. Uh, we want you to uh, uh, put your abstract up. You can put it in the uh, projects channel so that your other peer learners can look at what type of projects you need to, you are thinking of doing. Okay, it's not too late to change your projects or things like that if you uh, find your current project too challenging uh, or uh, you want to find other team members and other people are willing to join your cause. Okay, so the whole point, uh, again, that the project is for you to put in somewhere between 40 and 60 hours worth of work um, using a, uh, you know, a, a, a GitHub code that you might find from papers and experimenting with it for a data set of your choice. Okay. Uh, you can also choose, as I said earlier, to do a homework assignment uh, that might be specified by another class uh, or uh, trying to replicate a paper. All of those are fine ways that will get you hands-on time with the relevant NLP technology. Okay, that's the whole point of the lab rotation and also for all of our external participants as well. Okay, you guys will be participating in steps. Um, it's not finalized what that looks like yet, but hopefully soon we will know uh, some more details. And so you can enter in your project uh, title, your abstracts and your group members fairly soon. Okay, so uh, that's all the updates that I have from my side. So now I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Okay, so who is the presenters for today? Are they here? If you're here, um, you can uh, put a yes uh, in the participants list or something like that. And um, if the first presenter is ready, uh, they can go ahead and share their screen. Okay, I think I, I am the first presenter and I will show my screen now. Thanks, Shuanga, go ahead. Okay. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. Uh, I am the first presenter. My name is Shuang and I am a uh, master student um, in data science at NYU. Mm, so uh, today the, the topic I would like to present is um, unsupervised alignment based iterative evidence retriever for multi-hole question answering. Um, oh, what's your comment? Uh, yeah. So let's start with uh, what is the, uh, the definition of the problem we want to resolve. Um, first, what is a multi hole question answering? Uh, that means um, to answer this question, um, we need to um, reason uh, reasons through multiple evidence, and we need an evidence chain to get the correct answer. Here is an example. Um, the, when the question is uh, exposure to oxygen, oxygen and water uh, can cause iron to be 
uh, and there are several um, multiple choices. So the justification sentences would be uh, when a matter roots, the matter becomes orange on the surface. And the second sentence, iron roots in the uh, presence of oxygen and water. So with only one of these sentences, we cannot uh, get the correct answer um, to for the question. But but ha uh, when, we, when we have the combination of these two uh, sentences, we would have the correct answer. So that is the um, Marty Hall question answering. So, uh, but in this paper, we want to um, focus on the evidence retrieval. That is uh, given a corpus uh, or like a paragraph or a passage and a query. Uh, we want to know whether the answer is correct um, uh, through, through part of the, the passage or paragraph. And this part of the passage is the evidence for the, uh, for the question. Um, so um, wh why we want to um, focus on the evidence retrieval? That is because uh, first we can improve the performance um, by evidence retrieval, because um, if we we can um, we can focus we can locate the correct answer more um, accurately, because now we know uh, which sentences are related to the questions and which sentences are are uh, irrelevant. Mm, and second, we can because um, through the evidence retrieval, we can explain the decisions of the corresponding um, classifiers. So. Um, the explanation. Sorry. Oh, okay. I can continue. Um, so the explanatory, um, explainability of this model can. Um, so yeah, evidence retrieval can give us some a sense of the uh, explain explainability uh, of classifiers. So now I will focus on the details of their approach. Uh, I think um, this paper in, impressed me because it used a really uh, simple approach, but it can have a performance better than most of other um, supervised and unsupervised uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, methods. Mm. And uh, in this process, if you have any questions, you can ask me to stop and uh, um, and we can have discuss. Um, so the approach they, they proposed is named alignment-based iterative retrieval. It, it is consists uh, of two components. The first one is an unsupervised iterative component that retrieves chains of justification sentences given a query. Uh, by unsupervised, it means we only, uh, we can retrieve the evidence um, by, by only use the query and the candidate answer. We will look at it uh, in the following part. And, the, and the, the second component is an answer classification model. Mm, it can uh, classify a uh, candidate answer as correct or not uh, by um, given the original question and the previously retrieved justifications. Um, so in the first com component, it is a iterative justification retrieval. We first initialize the query uh, with the concatenate, with concatenated question and candidate answer. Mm, here, uh, because we, here uh, we want, there is a, it is a, a classification question. So we know the candidate answer, but if we don't know the answer, uh, then we will only use the question itself. The, sec the second uh, step is we will repeat the following steps. The first one is to retrieve the most, uh, retrieve the sentence that is most similar to our query um, through, a, through an alignment information retrieval approach. By alignment, we mean uh, to compute the Mm, cosine similarity between the uh, user word embeddings. Uh, so we have some vectors of the query and the vector of the um, 
represent the candidates the candidate sentences, and we calculate we calculate the cosine similarity by uh, tokens by tokens. So we can we can imagine that we can have a cosine similarity matrix, and to use this matrix matrix we take a max pooling to have a vector of the scores. And so these scores can measure how similarity the query and the uh, text and the uh, candidate sentence is. And then we compute the element-wise dot product between the vector of the scores and the vector containing the IDF values. So uh, the final score is, is in fact a um, um, similarity score, which is uh, which is um, with the weight of, which is an average similarity um, based on the weight of uh, the frequency of, of tokens. Mm. And then the second step is uh, after now we have selected the uh, candidate sentence, then we, we focus on the missing information because, um, because for the query, uh, now we have the justification sentence and we, we want to know, um, we want to find the next justification sentence. So we, now we want to, um, we want to know what is we focus on. Um, that is the keywords are not covered by the current uh, evidence chain. So now uh, if we have the re remainder terms, that is some keywords are not covered by the current evidence chain. We use this as the new query and then pull the new query to uh, go back to the first step to find the next candidate, uh, the next justification sentence. Here, uh, when we consider a term, uh, whether it is covered by the evidence chain, uh, we not just uh, find the token, uh, look for the token in the um, in the evidence set, but we we can uh, find the tokens that has a cosine similarity uh, larger over than a threshold. In this paper, they said the threshold to be 0 0.95. Mm, and, uh, and there is a termination condition um, that first, uh, if there is new query terms are discovered in the last uh, justification re we retrieved, then we think, oh, okay, now we cannot find any other um, better justification sentence. So we stop this, uh, these steps. And then um, if all of the query terms has been covered by the justification retrieved, uh, then we say, okay, all of the term has been uh, has been covered, so we did also we stop these uh, repeating steps. So now uh, we have the whole uh, evidence chain, and then we can pull the evidence chain um, and the query together into the supervised answer classification models. Uh, in this paper, we we use the Robota as a as a classifier. Okay, uh, so here is a visualized uh, example. Mm, the passage is, uh, here is the passage uh, which is composed by uh, uh, yeah, 15 sentences. And the query is, who was the uh, economically strongest family in Japan's early history? And the, um, the candidate answer is the Sogas. Um, then, so first we align this query with their candidate sentences in this paragraph, and we select the candidate, uh, we select the, uh, the most similar sentence to the query, which is as, a, as, as this early stage, blah, blah, blah. And uh, now the missing part of this query is economically strongest family, Japan, early history, Sogas which is the uh, terms that appear in this, um, this justification sentence. So we use these terms as the new query and we find the second uh, justification sentence by aligning the new query to the candidate sentences. Um, and we repeat these steps 
until uh, now in this uh, in this example, uh, until the coverage rate is uh, one hundred percent. So the um, the the retriever is terminate, and we put the evidence chain uh, and the query and the candidate answer into the answer classification model. Uh, this is um, this is the first evidence, and in fact, we can par par uh, we can parallelly um, retrieve other evidence chain by using the um, by using the different first justification sentence. In this paper, uh, the authors set a lot of experiments, and uh, on mainly on the two data sets. The first one is uh, multi-sentence reading comprehension, and the second one is uh, the question answering using sentence composition. There are uh, some difference between the two data sets. Um, in the multi-RC data set, every question is based on only one paragraph, and uh, we have the goal justification sentences that is uh, annotated. And uh, but in the QAS, uh, QASC, the um, each question is um, there is no specific paragraph that each question is based on. Uh, it is in it is based on a large uh, knowledge base, uh, so. So we cannot uh, locate the paragraph, and uh, um, and so we can use the every sentence of the paragraph as candidate justifications for a given question in the multi RC dataset. But for the QASC, we have to use uh, a heuristic information retrieval method that we can return eighty candidate sentences um, for for the question. And, and another difference is um, in the multi RC, each question has uh, multiple answers. So it is a uh, uh, multiple choice. <laughs> yeah, ma uh, so it, it can have multiple choice. And, but in the QASC, each question can have only one answer. So uh, therefore, for the, um, for the, uh, the embedding of the CL, CLS uh, token after we go through the Robota. Um, for the multi RC, we will use a sigmoid layer that we, that we can do the uh, binary classification for each candidate answer. But for the QASC, because it, there is only one answer, so we can use a softmax layer to choose the answer uh, with, the, with the largest probability. And here are the baselines for the multi RC and QASC task. Mm. For multi RC, the, the, the first baseline is that we fit all of the passage sentences to the Robota classification rather than fit only the evidence chain that we retrieved. And the second baseline is to retrieve the top K sentences. Uh, and uh, because we use the same alignment approach to retrieve the sentences, the sentences, uh, the difference between this baseline and and the approach the author uh, proposed is that um, the the number of the sentence uh, in a evidence chain is not fixed here. Mm, so we can see whether uh, this is important by compare the this baseline and choose the uh, approach we proposed. And the third baseline is to use a supervised robot classifier. Um, so here we will include not only the query, but also um, the, the justification sentences that is annotated in this training set. Mm, so, and for the QASC, we use the first baseline for the multi RC. And here is the performance. Mm. In the first block, it is the, uh, we show the first the in Intel passage and the Robota classifier. And second, uh, the alignment based uh, um, retrieval, uh, retrieval model uh, where K is fixed and the Robota classifier. 
Mm, and the, in the second block, it is the uh, supervised, supervised uh, method. And in the last, uh, in the last block, it is the A AIR just, uh, justification method. So we can see that um, AIR can um, outperform all of the baselines um, with different settings. Okay, oh, I forgot to, <laughs> yes. Uh, for the performance, we, we do two different tasks. Uh, the first task is evidence se selection, which is uh, for a query and the candidate answer. Uh, we will select the uh, we select the justification sentences, and uh, uh, the last three uh, columns are the for performance for this task. And um, for and the, these three um, columns are the performance for for question on three. Um, task that is we, yeah we we put the or passages or passages or uh, the evidence we retrieved into the classifi classifier and to answer the uh, whether the answer is uh, the candidate answer is correct. And then for the. Uh, test data set, we only do the question answering task. Mm, and we can see that the Robota plus ARR can still uh, outperform other baselines, uh, other methods, some other um, previous methods. Okay, and uh, after, um, after these experiments, the authors also have some analysis. The first analysis is uh, a sentiment, uh, a semantic drift analysis, which is uh, we will we will not only focus on the missing information when we reform the uh, reformulate the new query, but we will ca um, concatenate the justification sentence we retrieved, um, and the result is uh, the the result is that the when we focusing on the missing information, the performance would be better. The second, uh, the second one is, um, they analyze the robustness of hyperparameters. That is the threshold. Um, the first threshold is t. Uh, that is the shortest length of a query uh, we would like to um, use as a as a new query. Mm, if the if the so if the missing information on uh, that the terms that are not covered in the evidence chain is less than the threshold, we will uh, we will concatenate the justification sentence we retrieved. Um, um, so, and the, and the hyperparameter M, which is the threshold for cosine similarity, that we will con consider two tokens are uh, the same. Um, here, um, the best um, hyperparameter M is 0.95 for both uh, the multi RC task and the QASC task. Um, but for the hyperparameter T, which is the shortest length of a query, um, there is some difference. For the multi RC, uh, two word query is acceptable. And uh, for the QASC, um, for for word query is acceptable. Um, that means the best hyperparameter T is different in the, these two tasks, but it makes sense because um, multi RC uh, can look, because the, each query in multi RC is, low, is based on only one paragraph. So uh, there, there is less likelihood that we will uh, confuse about, uh, about the new query we formulated. But for the QASC, because the question is not based on um, only one passage or paragraph, it is based on not a huge uh, knowledge uh, knowledge base. So we want to make the query more uh, specific to the uh, missing information. And last, the 
they analyze um, the saturation of supervised learning by um, they sample they sample only a proportional a proportion of the training data uh, for the supervised learning, uh, like uh, um, two percent, five percent, ten percent, fifty percent, or eighty percent, and uh, they they found that they found that all of the um, classifiers approach their best performance at around only uh, five percent of the training data, which means that the classic um, the supervised method can convert uh, converge quickly, but they are unlikely to outperform. Oh, this is yeah. the registration fee. Registration fee as most. Uh, hello? Hi. Oh, yeah, we can hear you. We can. You can hear. Oh, you can yeah. Hear me. So, yeah. um, do you have any other uh, parts that you want to present? Because uh, from looking at the paper, it seems like you've gone through all of the analysis as well, right? Oh uh, yeah. Okay. All of the analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I I I will I present it uh, as detailed as I can. Um. So for the supervised le learning, so. Um, because we we have seen that um, our unsupervised uh, methods um, performs better than the supervised learning, so we want to see uh, whether um, if we uh, add more um, like more data into the supervised learning, can supervised learning uh, outperform the unsupervised approach? The answer is no, because uh, we can see that only 5% of the training data can achieve their um, similar performance as uh, 100 of them. Mm. So now it's the conclusion. Mm. Overall, I, I think I, I appreciate this uh, paper because it is really uh, simple and th this is an unsupervised uh, approach, but it can outperform a lot of different other approaches. Uh, and because of it's, uh, it's simple, so it is transparent to see uh, how we retrieve the evidence. Um, but if, if we use a supervised learning way, maybe we will not um, understand it. Um, yeah, I think that this is that is all of the approach uh, in this paper. So, uh, do you have any questions? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, let's first uh, thank Strong for the presentation, and then Yaman, yeah, you have the first question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, can I ask a question? So, yeah, because I, I happen to work on a project uh, similar to this, uh, 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 the question I want to ask is that, uh, like, uh, as far as I know, one key challenge in the uh, like uh, evidence retrieval for multi-hop question answering is that uh, it's very difficult to uh, to extract the passages that contains the bridge entity. Uh, because the bridge entity does not uh, explicitly contains in the question. So for example, uh, uh, so, so for example, like this question, uh, who is the head coach uh, of the team that won the gold medal in 2016 uh, men uh, basketball Olympics? So uh, for example, like this multiple question, uh, you first need to know that uh, uh, the team that won the gold medal is uh, actually USA, and then you, then find out who is the head coach of USA, but uh, but because the USA does not uh, uh, does not appear in the question, so it is difficult for the retrieval model to retrieve the relevant passage uh, to retrieve the passage that relevant to USA. Uh, so, uh, uh, but for this model, I'm a little confused because uh, uh, can you go back to the like uh, uh, the the page that has the example? I mean the. Uh, the 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 graph. This one. Ah, yeah, this one. So, yeah. uh, so if I understand correctly, uh, uh, so, uh, uh so uh, although it did this in the like a uh, iterative, uh, iterative way. Uh, I mean, iterative way, but uh, uh, it still like to 
uh, the, the queries still uh, only contains the keywords appears in the question. So, uh, so I, my question is, does this model uh, helps to address uh, the problem that I just uh, mentioned uh, uh, to help to retrieve the passage related to the bridge entity that do not appear uh, in the question? Uh, yeah, okay. Mm, well, I think for your question, mm, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, if I understand the concept of a bridge entity correctly, um, maybe when we retrieve the justification sentence, uh, it will appear some uh, information about the entity that is not uh, appeared in our the original query. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I, I understand. Okay, so, uh, and then, yeah. uh, then in the in this process, maybe uh, when in the last, uh, if the query is uh, is too short to 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 formulate a new query, then we will add the uh, the evidence um, we retrieved to the to the. Oh, okay, okay. Let's see. Uh, yeah, because we have. Um, we have the whole evidence chain and the evidence chain, in the evidence chain, there is some justification sentence that uh, include your uh, bridge entity. So I think yeah. um, when, we, when we pull the um, evidence chain and the, the original query to the classifier, it, it will have some uh, information about the bridge uh, entity. Does okay. uh, this can solve the question? And another way, uh, because I am now um, working on a uh, multi-hope question answering over the knowledge graph, uh, I, I was wondering whether your um, database conclude a knowledge base, a knowledge graph. So if there is a knowledge graph and uh, uh, the query is not related to your bridge entity, so it means um, uh, maybe there is some ages or the ages in the knowledge graph that can help you to retrieve the bridge entity. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I just want to make sure everyone understood uh, what uh, Yangming was asking about. So um, okay. if I can just check whether everyone understands the idea of a bridge entity. So a bridge entity is basically exactly what Shuang Gao is saying is that like you look at um, uh, either a justification or a potential answer and you're looking for some text um, that helps to connect two sentences together. And uh, Liang Ming was uh, referring to the bridge entities as being something hard to find, especially if you are, are looking for an answer and the question doesn't specifically mention enti any entities that help you anchor it. If there is very general words like the best team coach or something like that, and um, it might be hard to locate uh, the appropriate answer. Okay, um, so uh, Tongyao has a question, so we'll let uh, Tongyao go next. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I still still regarding this example. So as your query gets shorter and shorter, like initially we have a lot of words in the query, and then gradually the the query gets shorter. Will it make the alignment less accurate? Because that, let's say lastly, we only have SOGAS as the as the query, then there may be multiple sentences that contains this word. So will this cause problem as we have shorter queries? Yes, yes, uh, you, you find a good point. Uh, in this paper, uh, we can, mm, do you see there, there is a query expansion uh, equals to no and query expansion equals to yes in the in the third one. Uh, so here the query expansion means um, oh, thank you. Um, here the query ex expansion means that when the query goes shorter uh, than the threshold, we will uh, expand the query by add the uh, last justification sentence uh, the the information of. Um, the last justification sentence to the query to make it uh, um, a query uh, with um, enough length. <laughs> and, and, and then 
um, use it to formulate a new query. Okay, so so the SOGAS query would, would be added something from the evident from the previous uh, sentence found, right? So yes. so it won't be just SOGAS. Okay. Okay. okay that's a good question. Uh, I think we have another question from Taha. So uh, yeah, I think after this, we probably have to proceed to the next paper because uh, we will be too slow otherwise. Okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah, thanks for the presentation. And I so I want to ask if uh, while doing their query formulation uh, and trying to find the next evidence sentence, do they take into consideration the proximity of the sentences, right? So let's say I chose one sentence as the first evidence, and then uh, probably the next sentence, the upcoming sentence should have more probability of becoming the next evidence. And I'm saying that because uh, there might be some cases where they co-refer to the same keyword in using different tokens, right? Let's say uh, following the uh, the example Liang Ming just gave, let's say uh, the first evidence sentence says uh, USA team participated uh, in the competition and the next sentence says uh, they won the gold medal. So in this case, we don't have a keyword, but they here actually in some way uh, points to the USA team, right? So do they have some mechanism that uh, kind of deals with this or? So, Sean, do you understand the question? Maybe I can rephrase it a little bit, okay? Because in, yeah. in the original uh, papers on question answering um, in the early 2000s, this was a very big part uh, of how to come up with an answer is that words that important. You don't just look at the sentences that contain the keywords, you look also at the sentences nearby because natural language is such that uh, you, know, you might introduce an identity and then refer to it as he, she, or the company in the following ones using co-reference, right? So I think Taha's uh, uh, um, looking at that aspect that the proximity of a, a, another sentence that might actually contain the bridge entity or the answer uh, would actually be um, uh, more likely if it's proximal to a, a current sentence that has already been retrieved as part of the justification. Okay, so um, there, are, there are lots of other things that we do in um, uh, traditional question answering, which is more of an IR area than an NLP area um, that uh, lends itself to this. Uh, proximity is definitely one of those things. And uh, other people in IR who didn't really consider the NLP parts also looked at the, you know, co-location of words, right? So they didn't have any idea of phrase structure or things like that. They say the more n-grams um, that are uh, related in one sentence that uh, are uh, clustered together, the heavier that sentence is uh, for a selection. So this is building off the TF-IDF concept that uh, Shuang uh, illustrated from this paper, right? So we're not just looking at TF-IDF, we're looking for um, whether those tokens that are have a high TF-IDF value, um, they're co-located um, often in the same sentence. And then Taha is extending that to say that, uh, you know, nearby sentences uh, certainly would get some value out of being nearby and more likely to be aligned as well. Okay, so uh, as you can see on uh, Shuang Skao's slide here, um, there isn't anything specifically to uh, take into consideration nearby proximal sentences in this particular approach, but that's certainly something that can be extended. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, so let's thank Shuang again for this um, very nice presentation to go over all the parts of this paper. It's a really interesting uh, and simple paper as uh, Shuang said. And I'd just like to say here that uh, uh, one of the important things that we need to think about too is um, you know, this, um, uh, this idea of beam search. So in, in this paper, you're using the first round of uh, query uh, justification sentences to launch the next set, right? So there's a dependency on the previous uh, results, right? If you get to the second or third one and somehow you're misled on the way, you end up with fairly poor results. 
So um, they didn't do it in this paper per se, but you could do it as well, is to extend this from a greedy search, which is, uh, you know, you take the best things from the first hop, then you use them to the line the second hop, then you use the ones that are best from the second hop to line from the first hop into some type of beam search, right? Where you say, I take the N best ca uh, candidates from each round, uh, whether or not um, they, they come up very well in the first round or very well in the second round. And I, I use whatever is best after the second round, uh, a combination of both the best from the first and the second and use them to do the third round. Okay, so there's some dependencies on that. So um, unfortunately this paper didn't do a lot of uh, analysis on what types of um, bridge uh, uh, justifications work well and what don't. Um, this is uh, of course a very important thing when you do your own NLP research is uh, as I have told my group many times, is to be able to analyze why the thing works and why it doesn't. Okay, of course, um, like all ACL papers, they ran out of room. Um, so um, they didn't go and, and tell us more about the uh, mesoscopic properties of the paper and how, how well it works on certain data sets. Okay, um, so I think uh, in light of this, we probably have to move to the next paper because it's already 40 past. So uh, we'll move on to our next presenter. Okay. Thanks so much again for your presentation. So uh, our next presenter, is it uh, Anab or uh, who, who else is up next? Is it Cheng Lei? Uh, hi, so I'm Anab and uh, I will be the next presenter. Okay, great. So uh, when you're ready, you can share your screen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we're fine. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, hi, my name is Anna Molana. Uh, I am a first year PhD student and also a student of the second lab rotation. And now I would like to discuss a paper entitled Unsupervised Question Answering by Close Translation. Uh, authored by Lewis et al. Uh, this paper was uh, presented at ACL on June 2019. Oops, sorry. Okay, so uh, let's start with the extractive question answering task, uh, which we already familiar with. Uh, so the extractive question answering is a task which given a context C and a question Q, then the goal is to extract an, an answer A uh, based from the question Q with the assumption that answer A lies between the context U. Uh, currently, uh, there exist supervision QO models that perform really well for extractive question answering. Yeah, but those models uh, need to be trained with a huge annotated of uh, examples. And those models also suffer in the performance when uh, applied outside the domain and language. Hence, making this approach uh, expensive and not scalable. Uh, those problem uh, motivate uh, the author to propose an unsupervised question answering method by uh, creating an unsupervised QA data generation and uh, explore to what extent high quality training data is required for the uh, extractive question answering task. Uh, okay, uh, to be able to do the unsupervised question answering, uh, we can start by having a model that can be able to generate QA data by taking specific document as the input and yielding a list of examples in the form of like a three parts question, context, and answer. Later, by using this, uh, by using this question, uh, th these examples, we can train a QA model by using any uh, QA supervision model uh, for this specific domain. Then uh, the main problem now is uh, how can we create such a unsupervised data generator with no QA supervision model. Uh, to build an unsupervised extractive QA data generator, we can formulate the problem into this way. First, uh, given some context, we can, uh, some documents, I mean, uh, we can generate a sample context. Okay, and then from this context, we can uh, like uh, generate list of possible candidate answers. And finally, from pair of context and answer, uh, we would like to generate the question. So uh, uh, it will divide it into three steps. The first one is the context, context generation, uh, followed by the, ex, uh, the answer generation. And finally, 
the last step is the question generation. Okay, uh, now I will uh, focus into the detail of those three steps. Okay, uh, the first step is a context generation. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we can simply uh, generate a context uh, by sampling a paragraph C of uh, appropriate length from any document. And based from that paragraph, for, based from that context, we can continue to the next step, which is answer generation by extracting all the possible answers by looking uh, at the non phrases or name entities lies in the context paragraph. Yeah, uh, so in this paper, they limit their answer to be only non phrases and name entities. Mm, and the second step is the question generation. Yeah, so in question generation, uh, it extract, uh, uh, it's extracting a question from an answer and context can be done into steps uh, by closed generation and closed translation. So uh, in closed generation, like uh, we create, uh, we will create a closed question. So the closed question is basically uh, fill in the blank question where we must the answer token from the context. And then we can reduce uh, the close question by uh, two steps, uh, two approach. Uh, the first one is the sentence level or the sub uh, level. Uh, for the uh, sentence level, uh, it is like taking sentence which overlap with the answer. And uh, in the sub uh, one, uh, we can further reduce the scope by only taking the sub from the sentence. And later, uh, we know that uh, the must token, which is the answer, is either name entities or non phrases. Uh, and this paper, uh, in this paper, they substitute the must token into a high level answer category based on their name entity labels. For uh, yeah, for example, if the uh, answer token is uh, the is name entities and uh, the label is time, they will change it into temporal. But uh, but if the answer token is non phrases because we also consider the non phrases then uh, they just substitute it with the must token not uh, with the high level answer category uh, and uh, the the second step is the closed translation uh, this is the like the main step uh, in this paper so uh, because those closed question that we got before is not enough because uh, it's not represent a natural uh, question so we need to transform those closed question uh, into a natural question, uh, uh, which is the question that we expect uh, in the real QA task. Uh, okay, and uh, in the closed translation, they have four ways to transform closed question into natural question. The first one is the identity identity mapping, which is the baseline uh, approach. Yeah. So in this approach, uh, is it is just mapping the mass token with the WH word. Yeah, uh, so uh, they, uh, we can choose the W as what randomly. For example, uh, we can choose like what or how or something like that. Or by using a W as heuristic, uh, which I will explain later. Yeah, so uh, I guess why this is work because uh, while the order of the word is not natural, as we can see that uh, we have the W as what in the end of the sentence, but the, res the result of this uh, this approach uh, still uh, still shares si like similar set of words with the natural question. Uh, and uh, we have a noisy clauses as the second uh, baseline. Uh, this approach is like uh, contains a set of rules. The first one is uh, we pre prepare the WH word by uh, randomly use uh, choosing any WH word or by using the WH heuristic, and then append a question mark at the end of the sentence, uh, and also deleting the, the mass token. Later, we can inject some noises like word dropout or uh, word uh, order permutation by like uh, changing the position of the words and, uh, and word masking, like masking some words. Uh, this is works because the difference between closed uh, question and uh, natural question uh, is as a form of uh, perturbation. And in the top method, we have a rule-based method, which is contains a set of rules like uh, looking at a syntactic transformation uh, with 
WH movement and type dependent choice of WH word. Uh, yeah, this kind of method already built by uh, Hellman and Smith 2010, uh, and uh, the author simply use their approach. Yeah, and the, this rule based method give like a more natural question uh, compared to the above uh, baseline, the noisy closures and the identity mapping. And uh, the last uh, method we have a sec to sec, a sequence to sequence model. Uh, this is like modeling the, the problem uh, as a machine transaction to translate from uh, like closed question into natural question. Uh, yeah, this paper borrows the idea uh, from uh, Lempel et al. Uh, on unsupervised neural machine transaction. Yeah, uh, and which is great because uh, this approach, uh, their approach does not require any parallel corpora at all. Uh, this model can be modeled uh, by using two objectives. The first one is by using the denoising auto encoder and uh, online back translation. So uh, let's say we want to translate from close to natural question. We can start uh, by having a close input and then we inject a noise, uh, gener generating the noise close input. And after this, we can train a language model, a denoising auto encoder uh, to learn in domain close question. And then we can do the same uh, for the natural question. So we have a natural input and then we inject the noise and uh, we train the auto denoising encoder, uh, denoising auto encoder uh, to learn the in domain natural question. Yeah, uh, and now at the same time, we can also train a sequence to sequence model to transcend from close question uh, to natural question by using a back translation model. We can, uh, like, uh, in order to do that, we can start again with a natural question and then uh, we uh, you, by using a forward model uh, with uh, the way is initialized by using the uh, the, out, the denoising auto encoder to translate this natural uh, question, this natural input into a close input. At this point, like we already generated a pair of natural and close question. Which later, by using this pair, we can train uh, the backward model, which is the model that we want, the model that translate the close question into the natural question. Uh, yeah, but uh, this forward model uh, also need to be trained. This forward model also need to be trained. Therefore, we need to train our back translation, both start from the uh, natural question and uh, from the close question. So we, we will have another uh, architecture uh, start from the close question and the, yeah, the architecture will be uh, similar like this one. And uh, next, to further improve the performance of their close translation steps, rather than picking random WH words, they incorporate a WH heuristic. So like uh, as we uh, discussed before, uh, for, the, uh, for the identity mapping and noise close approach to provide the relevant, re relevant WH word, they will choose uh, WH words based on their high level answer category. For example, if the higher level answer category is temporal, they will substitute uh, the token into when. But if the uh, high level answer category is numeric, they will uh, uh, substitute it into either how much or how many randomly. And uh, for the NMT approach, uh, they, they want to produce more precise question. So they prepend the close question with the high level answer category masking token at the start of the question. So for example, uh, we know that the WH word is when, so we uh, they add the high level answer category, which is the temporal uh, at the start of the, uh, at the beginning of the sentence. So uh, by doing this, uh, it allows the model to learn a much stronger association between WH word and the, uh, and the answer must type. So uh, for the experiments, uh, in, for the downstream task, they use like uh, they fine-tune bird models, uh, and also they uh, they use uh, 
the IDEF plus self attention as, as the QA models. And then uh, to train the UNMT for close translation, uh, they need a close and natural corpus. So for the close corpus, they gather like 5 million questions from Wikipedia and get the uh, and extract the close question by using the aforementioned procedure. And uh, for the natural question corpus, uh, they gather 5 million questions from English pages uh, get from commoncrawl.org. And then when selecting the question, they select only a sentence uh, which start by using WH word and end with a single question mark. And also the sentence cannot be longer than 20 seconds, 20 tokens, I mean. Uh, yeah, here is the test of all the setting mentioned before. Yeah, uh, so uh, the first blocks uh, represent all the all the result for the UNM by using the UNMT. The second box by using the noisy close, and the third box by using the identity. Yeah, if we look closer, we can see that uh, the NE by using NE as the close answer will give a better performance uh, compared to you to use the NPS the close answer. It is because uh, the average of the name entity per context is lower than the uh, known phrases, which help the model to reduce the space search in training phase. And like, uh, and using su subclause uh, uh, as the close boundary performs really well also. And to sum up, uh, by using uh, NE subclause, and using the UNMT as the cross translation uh, and incorporating WH heuristic uh, but best uh, achieve the best model so far. Okay, and uh, next they do the analysis on uh, of the effect of the question length and the longest common subsequence with the context of the generated question. Uh, so the blue line, the blue line here represent the length of the the length of the question and the red line here represent the longest common subsequence with context. Uh, yeah, the first blocks uh, is the distribution from the squad data set. So we know that the, the squad data set has a longer uh, has a shorter shorter uh, question length. Uh, yeah, qu uh, question length. So uh, if we are looking at the first section which is our NMT uh, plus subclass uh, model, we can see that uh, this, the distribution of this uh, model somewhat similar with the squad. Yeah. It, is, uh, it is because uh, of the subclass, because subclass makes the length of the question uh, shorter. And then uh, for the noisy clause, uh, if we look at the, uh, at the third, section, yeah, for the noisy clause, uh, uh, the noisy clause yield in more similar distribution than uh, to the squad because by using word dropout, it can further reduce the length of the question and by giving the perturbation, like adding word order permutation or adding a word massing, makes the longest common subsequence with context become smaller. And now uh, let's take a look at the examples of question generated by the UNMT. Yeah, uh, so in general, uh, we can observe that the, the closed question and the natural question is basically look alike, only differ in uh, like several words. And if we are looking at the first two examples, uh, the UNMT changed the word join into did they join and the word would be sold into would buy. So uh, it proved that uh, the UNMT uh, successfully learned the syntactic transformation from a statement to a question. Uh, beside that, if we are looking at the third and fourth uh, generated question, uh, we can see that the UNMT does give a good natural question. Yeah, this, uh, this question is good, but uh, this, this question is not relevant to the given answer. And the, uh, now uh, here is the overall results. So they 
<laughs> based on the base setting, uh, based on the base settings, uh, they train the QL model again by using a Bertlars and get like a 56.4 uh, as the F1 score, uh, which outperform all the unsupervised, unsupervised models as well as the baseline. But uh, we also can see the gap is quite big compared uh, to the uh, supervised model, which is like uh, got like 90 point as the F1 score. Okay, and uh, the conclusion is uh, this paper, first this paper uh, introduced a method learn, to learn uh, extractive question answering tasks in an unsupervised manner, manner and outperforms other unsupervised methods. Second one is uh, this, uh, this paper also introduced a way to generate a syntactic data without QA supervision, uh, which can be used to generate annotated training data from any domain. And the last one is uh, from this paper, we know that uh, on squad data set, natural question is less important than question context word matching. Because uh, if we are looking at the uh, at uh, this table, we know, uh, yeah, we can see that by using the UNMT, uh, if we compare by using the UNMT and by using noisy close, yeah, the gap is uh, not so high, not so, not so big, yeah. Uh, yeah, but noisy clues uh, only contains like simple rules and noises, but and it does not resemble any natural question at all. So that's why uh, uh, in squad data, uh, the the natural question is less important than than uh, question context word matching. Uh, yeah, I think that's all that I want to uh, present. Uh, is there any okay. question? We we actually have a lot of questions. It looks like so your paper is quite popular. Uh, so yeah, Taha has already said thank you for um, the presentation. So let's go ahead and thank Anab again for his presentation, first of all. So um, we'll go in the order that it says in the, the Zoom interface here. So Samson followed by Chun uh, and then Taha last. So uh, Samson, maybe you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, uh, yeah. So it, it seems from the both from the uh, heuristic generation and unsupervised generation, right? Yeah. It seems like there's a very high lexical overlap between the um, answer sentence or the context and the actual question itself, because it's pretty much the same thing, just with like slightly different syntax, right? So it it seems like if you're training with uh, this kind of uh, sentences, uh, this kind of, I mean, this kind of questions, then the performance will probably improve for questions that have very high lexical overlap. But for those that do not, it seems like it might not improve that well. It seems like a form of overfitting also, right? Yeah, so I, I, I take your comment into consideration, you know, when there's a strong match and a strong signal, probably using a, a smaller window of words like a subclause will work better. And I guess that's what uh, Anab has uh, shown through the results on the results page, right, that mm -hmm. performance seems to improve overall when you use more specific types of answer types, right, uh, NEs compared to NPs, uh, when you change the boundary into something more tight. Um, rather than incorporating more noise. But uh, point taken that if we look at certain types of questions where there might not be good matches, if we cut our data set into smaller parts where there's one part where there's not a, a, a high fidelity match and our, our matching scores are generally low, that using a, a expansion might actually help more. Uh, but for ones where the signal is uh, sufficient, maybe uh, winnowing down the window of the possibilities is better. And I guess what they're showing with this result is that most of the questions um, that they've come across in their data set tends to be having pretty high alignment. You know. I mean, yeah, and that's because they're using squat. And I mean, that's the way squat was kind of constructed, right? Because they basically gave people the the context and ask them to like highlight and write a question from that. So I guess people naturally also do that because they are kind of, you know, <laughs> they, are, they are kind of 
rephrasing the sentence into a question as opposed to I think some of the other data sets can't remember maybe like trivia or news QA or the Bing one where yeah. you're looking at like natural questions oh yeah I think natural questions so like they're using yeah naturally coming up with the questions first then finding the answer so that's that's yeah, a but there's there's a, a difference in the way you construct, and perhaps this particular method seems to work well at uh, uh, you know targeted to the uh, specific question manufacturing process that Squad uh, originally had, right? If we look at uh, more complicated MRC data sets like Squad Two, or um, more popularly nowadays Hot Pot QA or Dream, uh, those may be uh, very different types of cases, right? We talked about Dream a couple of weeks ago when we talked more about dialogue, right? But Hot Pot QA also features this um, multi-hop question generation, uh, which which we've also covered before. Yeah, in this sense, it's kind of like overfitting to a specific type of question that might not be representative of the real world, right? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately they didn't do this type of question analysis that would be more telling. They only experimented with squad. Uh, so we don't have any way of uh, really uh, assessing that claim that you're making, but it, it seems uh, plausible that it could overfit due to the fact that uh, the squad data set was generated uh, in a manner that's uh, quite uh, aligned to this approach, right? Yeah, actually uh, to add on that, uh, uh, actually, in my in my current project, I, I actually I have implemented this uh, as a baseline. Uh, I, I I want to uh, like use it to other data sets, but I find it's not working. Uh, the main problem is that uh, uh, like uh, the close translation part, like it copies too many words. Uh, I mean from the original like close. I mean, the questions has a, so the resulting questions has a very large lexical overlap with, with the passage. So uh, uh, like, like, uh, like you just said, uh, you know, uh, the squad data sets has such a property, but uh, the other data sets may not have. So uh, like it's not a very general uh, method, I think. Thanks for that, uh, Liang Ming. Um, Chengli has put up some links on the chat. I think they're related to the previous paper as well, but uh, you may want to look at them if you haven't, especially the scribe team. But we have another question from Chung. So Chung, you can go ahead and unmute, please. Okay, so uh, my question is about the translation between the closed questions to the natural questions using the unsupervised NMT, right? Uh, I'm not very sure about this, but uh, from my understanding of unsupervised uh, NMT, then uh, to have it to work, we need a not bad initialization of the translation models. So the syntactic data is uh, not bad at first, is it? And uh, for this, this case, then uh, what is the initial models that we use? Uh, so, uh, sorry, can you uh, repeat one more? So you mean that uh, the initializ initializ initializing model is not this one? Yeah. So. Uh, from my understanding of uh, Ansuwa NMT, then the initialization of these models of mm -hmm. uh, yeah need to be at least uh, not bad in order to have a good synthetic data, right? Oh, uh, America, right? Okay, so uh, in my uh, understanding- Form at least somewhat well, right? Uh, if you don't have very good line, it'll be pretty poor. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, yeah so uh, if my understanding is correct, uh, what I got is like, yeah, at the initialization, they 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 like train uh they create a, a general vocabulary by using the BPE. Yeah, uh, to share the the corp uh, yeah by so they join the cor the both corpora the close input and the natural input and they create a BPE vocab to share the context to all the yeah to all the language and then use that uh, embeddings as the input factor for the encoder and decoder and then uh, like yeah and then after that uh, they train the language model by by using the denoising auto encoder like this one uh, both for the close input and natural input and then uh, doing the back translation by using the forward model and the back forward model that's uh, what I understand oh, okay yeah 
Uh, maybe if uh, I wrong, you can uh, like yeah. Uh, actually, that's what uh, in my understanding. Mm. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Taha was the last one. Uh, Taha, do you want mm. to talk? Uh, give your question. Yeah, so my question was actually quite similar to what uh, Trung just asked. So I was going to ask, uh, since they uh, train both encoder decoder models separately, how they do? How do they make sure that the internal representations are in parallel so that they can use them uh, by mixing them up? But I think the answer and I've just gave is kind of explaining it. But if you have anything to add, I I'd be happy to. Uh, yeah. So the yeah to to have the share inter, uh, share uh, internal representation yeah they use the uh, they, they they are using the uh, sharing latent if I'm not mistaken they call it sharing latent representation yeah so yeah by, by uh, joining the corpora and then uh, create a embedding factor or something like that based on the corpora. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So great, uh, Anab, thanks for your presentation. You got lots of questions, that's great. Um, so we'll move on. I think uh, Cheng Lei is presenting the next paper if I'm not uh, incorrect. Yeah. Uh, well, sure. Cheng when you're ready, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, give me a minute. I need to reset my system preference. Okay. Uh, while Cheng Lei is uh, resetting his system preferences, again, uh, you guys uh, who are doing a project, especially your 6101 students um, who are uh, first year PhD students, you do need to put up your abstract. Um, the abstract uh, you can uh, put a preliminary in the projects channel on slack and as i wrote there i will try to uh, give a little bit of critique for each of them over the next week um, so that uh, you can get some feedback but if you find other people's projects interesting again i would um, advise that you look and read through them and if you have any comments please uh, just reply uh, to the thread that they've started okay so that we can all help each other with this Okay, and project teams, uh, I'm sure you're coordinating with each other, but it's a, a good idea to split up some of the responsibilities. We obviously want you all to be actually working with the toolkits, but uh, you know, uh, finding some way to share the load uh, for pre-processing the, the data and um, coming up with plots uh, or charts to come up with the results, that's also a good thing to try to do. We all know you're going to be very busy towards the end of the semester and we appreciate um, your time to complete the projects as best as you can. So um, my advice is always to try to uh, do a, a first version of your project as quickly as possible, even though it has a lot of caveats, it may not use a lot of data, you may not be able to replicate results very well, and then at least be able to say that you finished the project from um, end to end, if you pardon the pun, um, so that you have something done, and then to refine that, you know, fine tune it, if you will, uh, so that you can get a better result uh, by enlarging your data or by doing, doing more analysis, okay? Those are all critical things in order to get a project finished. All right, so uh, Cheng Lei, are you ready? I think Cheng Lei may have dropped the call in order to restart uh, his uh, setup. Is that correct? I'm not really sure. We'll wait for him for another minute or two. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen right now? You can start. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, wait. so the paper I'm presenting is actually a follow-up paper uh, on the paper just now. So um, uh, I think the slides is loading. So uh, yeah, just now, uh, Liang Ming and uh, Prof Ming was talking about uh, some problems uh, with uh, previous method and uh, one of the biggest problems is that uh, uh, yeah one of the biggest problems is that uh, 
because uh, they are essentially uh, generating the questions by uh, like uh, translating the original uh, evidence sentence from the paragraph. So uh, this kind of question generation will have uh, like the generated questions will have very high lexical overlap with the original paragraphs. So um, um, this kind of generation is probably fine for us. some questions in Scott because uh, those questions are really like just doing word matching. So uh, that's fine. But for some other questions that um, like uh, they don't have uh, such high uh, lexical overlap, then such uh, methods will be uh, like very difficult to perform well. So uh, yeah, so this paper is trying to address this problem. And uh, just a side note, I was uh, watching this tutorial at ACL by Denchi and uh, she was talking about uh, stuff on open domain QA and uh, she actually classified the data set into two types. Like one type is uh, uh, constructed by uh, and, and those annotators where uh, they were presented with the uh, question and answers and like, like they were presented with the answers already. Then, then they try to write the question and uh, find the corresponding evidence. So this is like uh, how uh, squad and uh, like trivia QA, this kind of data sets were constructed. And it's, it's, there's another kind of data set like uh, natural questions where they are called uh, genuine information seeking questions. So uh, when they are constructing such data sets, uh, queries were generated without knowing the final answer. So they are really like trying to find the answer. So um, as a result, the two types of data sets were very different. So for this work and the previous work, um, the method was just evaluated on the first type of uh, data sets, like squad and uh, trivia QA and news QA, this kind of, uh, where in this kind of data sets, I think a lot of questions are really about uh, word matching. So I guess this kind of method would um, perform uh, relatively well, but uh, if you transfer it on other data sets, like those kind of genuine information seeking data sets, then it uh, may need some uh, other adaptations. Okay, and uh, so uh, that was the first limitation of the previous method. And uh, another, another limitation is that uh, the answer category was limited to just a uh, name entity or noun phrases. Yeah, so uh, it cannot have, like, handle uh, cases where the answer, and, uh, the answer is actually uh, some other types. So we will see how uh, this work address the problems. So uh, the first step is that uh, they're trying to uh, harvesting this uh, rough QA data set. So essentially, I think uh, the whole process of unsupervised uh, QA or reading comprehension can be decomposed into two components. So the first component is that you need to construct a, a question answering data set like without any, uh, like automatically construct this uh, QA data set. And then the second component is uh, you just train a reading comprehension model on top of this uh, newly constructed data set. So I think the second component is uh, rather straightforward because you can just apply any existing uh, reading comprehension models. I think uh, for this and the previous work, they all used like a fine tune or broader robot model. So that's uh, pretty standard. So I think the key focus is on the first component, like uh, how do you get a very good uh, uh, question answering data sets like uh, using a uh, uns uh, unsupervised or automatic manner. So um, just now in, in the uh, previous work, uh, they were what they did is that uh, so for a statement for a statement in the paragraph, they essentially uh, like select an uh, answer first and then they like uh, translate the uh, statement statement into a question using uh, unsupervised unsupervised machine translation techniques. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you use that technique, the resultant question will look very, uh, like will have very high lexical overlap with the original statement in the paragraph. So what the authors in this paper propose is that, uh, okay, we still use the original statement in the paragraph and then we select answer. So in this example, uh, the answer is this uh, Elysium. And then, uh, so they select the answer and then they uh, get the, uh, they, they, tra they translated like, uh, they use a different technique to translate uh, this uh, uh, statement into a question. But then uh, they will not use this same uh, paragraph as a context. Rather, they will use uh, this cited document as a context. So um, a very uh, special thing in Wikipedia is that uh, there are a lot of uh, hyperlinks. So, uh, uh, so in, for example, in this case, the uh, statement actually has uh, another link and uh, links to another uh, document. 
And the document that it links to is uh, very closely relevant to this uh, paragraph, but it, 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 like in terms of phrasing and uh, the, the vocab that it uses, it's very different from the original paragraph. So we can actually use the cited document as a context uh, for this question. So if we do this, then the generated question will not have very high lexical overlap with the context because uh, the context is actually not the original paragraph, but rather uh, another paragraph that uh, the original one links to. So uh, this sounds like a very simple approach, but uh, yeah, it kind of uh, avoids the high le lexical overlap problem. And uh, another change that, that they are making is that uh, they are using a different technique to generate the questions. So just now, uh, they were used. Uh, the previous paper was using uh, uh, like uh, unsupervised machine translation technique, but in this one, they are using a rule, uh, uh, some sort of a rule-based system. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so for the so uh, yeah, once they have uh, chosen a uh, answer entity in this case, so like uh, yeah, so in this case, the answer is the 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 name of the movie and then it was uh replaced with a mask scene like uh this is a category of the if the of the answer type and then uh they need to trans translate this uh sentence into a natural question so what they did is that they use a uh, like, like a rule-based system based on uh, the dependency tree of the this uh sentence so the whole thing is like uh firstly you get a dependency path of the sentence and then uh if the sub like uh, for all the yellow nodes in the dependent tree, it means that uh, its child node actually contains the answer. So for all these kind of nodes, they actually uh, move it to the first child node of the of this level. So like uh, for the node about it, it move it to the as the first child node, and they they do this to every uh, this kind of yellow nodes here, and then they just do a uh, in order travel. So so. Um, when you do in order treatment, so and uh, you are just like uh, for so the thing it will be replaced with what so uh, it's same as the previous paper so they are like uh, they map the different category into the corresponding wh words so it will be like uh, what his upcoming movie uh, about uh, this uh, Leo Leomo uh, uh, crash uh, like crash uh, Matt Damon interview then comma. So you just do a in order travel of the new uh, dependency tree, then you get a uh, uh, some uh, um, I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent natural, but uh, yeah, you get something like a natural question. Um, I think this is much simpler than the um, translation approach, and uh, um, the example shown here, uh, I guess, is uh, somewhat cherry picked. So um, this example it actually looks uh, okay, but I guess. Uh, the, the problem with rule-based system is that uh, there are like uh, many, many different variations of language. So sometimes it may not be uh, that perfect. Um, but again, uh, I think it's still, I, I guess it's still better than the translation approach because um, based on my own experience, uh, it's very hard to control the quality of uh, natural language generation systems. And sometimes the uh, generated content may not be that uh, semantically relevant to the original content. So in that case, there will be a big problem. So if we use such a rule-based system, at, at least we know that the generated questions are like, uh, they are closely relevant to the original sentence. So uh, yeah, it's just that sometimes it, it might be perfectly natural. Okay, so that was the uh, first step. And then uh, they did another uh, improvement. So uh, in the beginning, I was saying that uh, the whole unsupervised QA can be decomposed into two components. And uh, uh, so the normal setup is like, uh, we treat the two comp components different, uh, like separately. So we uh, just gather the uh, data set first and then we train a model on top of the data set. But uh, we can actually uh, do something to like uh, use the feedback from the reading part to improve the uh, data set construction part. So that is what they did in this paper. And uh, this is called uh, iterative data refinement. So it actually uh, contains like two different uh, steps. So firstly, they, they get like um, using a step one, they gather this uh, rough QA data set, and then uh, they train a initial QA model on a subset of this uh, QA data set. 
and then actually did some filtering and refinement using this uh, QA model. So what they did is they drawn uh, inference on uh, other unseen uh, examples in the ref QA data set. And then they say whether the predicted answer is the same as the uh, gold answer in the ref QA data set. And if it is, and they will just keep the original question. And uh, this will like be called uh, the filtered uh, examples. Then if not, if, if it is not, uh, in other words, if the predicted predict prediction of the QA model is different than a, a gold label, then they will actually do some refinement. They will actually set the uh, the model's predicted. Uh, they will set the model's prediction as a new answer, and then they will just uh, regenerate the question based on the new answer, and then they will put this uh, refined uh, example into the uh, training data set, and they will actually do this uh, like in uh, iteratively in, in several rounds. And uh, the motivation for this whole thing is that uh, for the filtering part, they want to get rid of some uh, noisy examples. Like, uh, uh, like yeah, so intu intuitively is if the uh, trained model's prediction uh, like agrees with the code label, and it should mean that uh, this um, CQA shepherd is, uh, like it is, it is, it is uh, makes sense or it's, uh, the answer is probably uh, right. And uh, for the refinement part is that uh, the motivation is that uh, like some candidate answers are not extracted by any art because uh, you know, when we are constructing this ref QA data set, we are still uh, ju just using some uh, chunking or some uh, name entity recognizers to get the name entities as the answers. So, but uh, in some times, like in some cases, uh, the, un the best answer may not be uh, a named entity. So we just let the model. So we just let the model do the prediction, and we just use whatever whatever the model predicts as a new answer. So the new answer A prime here, it may not be a named entity, can be like any other type. Then we just generate the, the corresponding question for it. So in this refined uh, um, CQA shepherd, uh, the answer types are, are not no longer restricted to just uh, named entities. It can be anything that the model thinks it is the best, and then uh. We train the model iteratively on, on each run. So uh, yeah, this shows the whole process of uh, uh, how to do it. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's basically what we talked about in the previous slide. So um, this slide shows the results. So they just evaluated on squad 1.1 at new square. And we can see that uh, in the bottom two rows, uh, their method actually achieved uh, a uh, very big improvement over the, the previous methods. So yeah, the levels at all baseline is basically the paper that Anna talked about just now. So you can compare the numbers and you can see uh, it's actually a pretty big improvement. Yeah, and uh, uh, the show some uh, analysis. Uh, yeah, so this is comparing uh, from the uh, close translation to a close sentence to a uh, natural question translation. So uh, the UNMT is basically the unsupervised MT approach uh, that the previous paper talked about. And the DRC is using the uh, dependency tree construction method that uh, this paper uses. And you can see that, uh, uh, actually I personally feel that both, uh, in both cases, the both uh, outputs are not like 100% uh, natural, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's close. It's pretty close. Like uh, even like for the rule based system, it's actually uh, uh, still understandable, I guess. Yeah. And uh, and this is a, a result for the future setting. I I think this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, so uh, for the future setting, it basically means that uh, I did the pre I actually pre train the like uh for for like take the bird model and I I first do a pre train using the unsupervised method that I, I talked about just now. And then I will use a few labeled training examples and then I do fine tuning on this uh, on these uh, labeled training examples. Um, so the X axis here shows the number of labeled training examples that I use. So for example, uh, the, the 100 here means that I, I first uh, pre-trained bird large uh, using uh, one of the unsupervised QA methods, uh, either uh, the previous one or this one. And then uh, I will fine tune this model on 100 uh, label training squad examples only. And you can see actually compared to without using the, like uh, this bird large baseline is just uh, 
direct, directly using uh, directly fine tuning the first model on this uh, 100 label examples without doing uh, pre-training using uh, leverage at all or the unsupervised methods in this paper. So you can see uh, if we first pre-train using the unsupervised QA method, it can, it can actually achieve a uh, very big improvements. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, when you increase the number of uh, labeled examples uh, like to over 10,000, then the difference uh, becomes uh, very, very small. And yeah, so I guess it eventually shows that if you have a lot of labeled examples, then you probably uh, won't benefit much from uh, questioning using this kind of uh, unsupervised methods. Um, but again, I think the selling point of this kind of uh, unsupervised methods is under the scenarios that uh, you don't actually have a lot of uh, labeled training examples. So uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's it, that's my part. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions. Okay, let's uh, uh, thank our speaker. Let's thank Chen Lei for presenting this newer paper. So um, uh, we don't have any questions yet. So uh, if anyone wants to go, Chung, you have a question, you can go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in the iterative refinement, uh, the, so we use a model prediction to refine the new data, right? So if mm -hmm. the model is not well trained, then the refined data set might get worse and worse, right? So I'm asking like if uh, human have to manually tune the model at each duration or they let the model tune itself? And... Um, they actually, uh, so they first predefine us like, uh, they set a hyper hyper parameters like M. So they split into like M uh, sets. So actually they did the iterative refinement M runs, but uh, like in every run, they just uh, let the model train stuff. So, so uh, yes, you mentioned that there is a case that especially in the initial runs, the model uh, may not be that good yet. So it probably the generated predictions are, uh, might be wrong, but, um, Empirically, the result the results seem good, and also the orders actually argue that uh, because they are actually using a pre-trained BERT model, so the model actually already uh, has a lot of um, prior knowledge. So uh, even if you just pre-train on a, a a few initial runs, um, it the model is actually still pretty good and can do pretty good refinements. Yeah. Other questions. So I think Chun's question is uh, quite interesting in the fact that uh, both uh, the questions from this round and uh, the previous round that uh, you asked about were about when the augmentation methodology goes awry, right, uh, awry. So uh, you, you get more noise than you bargain for and you mislead the system into answering the wrong type of thing. So there's two things that are at fault here. It could be that the original question um, uh, doesn't allow a lot of augmentation, okay? Or it could be that the, whatever we pull in as augmentation causes things to go worse. Um, I don't think um, in either paper, we have a very good analysis of which, which type of problem happens. But uh, as you can see in, in all of these systems, there's still quite a lot of room to make up in performance, even for something as simple as squad 1.1. Of course, these are all unsupervised systems, right? So um, what, what type of um, uh, other pieces of information can help close the gap from the, the 70th percentile until we get to the uh, 90th percentile, which is where the current supervised uh, um, uh, state of the art is. So I think there are a number of us uh, on this uh, call who are doing question answering uh, machine reading comprehension research. So uh, uh, Shuang mentioned that she is, um, um, Niang Ming is uh, doing his internship at UCSB with William Wang and is also doing things of this sort. And a, a number of other of you are interested in MRC. So um, any, any ideas that you want to surface up? So one of the things I think is quite interesting is the way that uh, the researchers in the various papers have looked at it. Uh, we see a, a lot of attention on named entities, right? And also question words, of course, those two are very much related, right? So the type of question word in English um, uh, also indicates the type of named entity to a certain extent. But, uh, you know, in other languages or in other 
um, yeah, in other domains, there may be uh, more refined uh, sets of questions or uh, identities that uh, would be uh, interesting to look at. Um, for example, if you wanted to do uh, question answering on scientific documents, which is a, a mainstay of research in my lab, you know, we want to know information about data sets or methods or um, uh, evaluation metrics, right? But uh, they are all going to be referred to with their question type of what, right? Because um, they're, they're, they're not named entities, they're not people or, or places, right? So um, unfortunately in English, uh, you know, uh, demonstrative uh, pr uh, pronouns like that are, are not an open class set. We only have a, a small set of uh, things uh, that we can ask about, right? But um, I'm wondering whether you guys have any uh, thoughts about how to do this data augmentation um, in a more refined way. We've seen both uh, uh, rule-based systems, uh, as well as ones that are using a more um, open-ended way of, of gathering questions. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I may share some thoughts about this uh, augmentation. So uh, I think uh, there are two, uh, two major ways to do that. So uh, it's uh, either generation based or retrieval based. So basically, uh, what you want to do is to synthesize some, uh, to generate some synthesized questions to augment your training data. So uh, basically, one way is like uh, 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 the two papers uh, we just discussed. Uh, so that is translation uh, generation based uh, to uh, use some uh, unsupervised method to like generate. Uh, a uh, 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 synthesized question. Uh, and another way may be like a retrieval based, uh, like to, uh, uh, if you have a large corpus of questions, uh, you may find some way to directly retrieve some questions from, from that corpus to enrich your training data. I uh, think, uh, mm, if for, for my understanding, uh, these are the major ways that are adopted by uh, Researchers. Those are very good points. I think we also can think about the, the gap between, um, you know, uh, few shot and multi shot uh, learning, right? Because let's say uh, supervised methods, as you can see, when they're provided with sufficient data, they can't really improve from any of these unsupervised methods, right? So when you can think about a question answering system or, a, you know, machine reading comprehension system, that uh, has to deal with few shot learning. For example, if, if it's on new domain or a new data set, how do you effectively bootstrap that? Okay, so um, that that's also, I think, a very interesting area, um, which uh, you can see from these papers are, are they're looking at, right? Uh, looking at the case where there's only a limited amount of data and then augmentation methods are going to help much more, okay? Um, the other thing I, I'd like you guys to think about is, uh, you know, what's the, the remaining gap? So we have 90% uh, F1 measure for a squad 1.1, um, you know, uh, maybe even better than that now. Okay. Um, so what, what remains? Why are 10% of the questions not being answered? Is it something that, um, you know, GPT-3 with all of its uh, many parameters is going to solve for us? Or is there some, uh, you know, underlying interesting linguistic or uh, question answering phenomenon that's really not being addressed at all? And um, if we try to make uh, roads into that area, would we get better results, right? So we covered the case of uh, multi-hop, um, you know, uh, to, to recover some of these things. But another area that I think the uh, NLP people have been working on for many decades that hasn't really found a very good uh, analogous uh, method yet is co-reference resolution, right? We sort of have pointer networks to help get around that, but they still are not very well informed by a linguistic principle um, to be able to align um, uh, entities like uh, pronominal references or definite references to the actual parts. Right. And, and sometimes we have these long-term or long-range um, uh, anaphora 
right? So you may mention a company in the first paragraph and talk about another company and then come back and mention the company again. And uh, you introduce it uh, to say the company or something like that, right? Uh, without repeating the actual named entity. And those sentences are, are, are lacking and, and likely not to be resolved properly, even with current pointer generation, uh, and, uh, current generation of pointer networks. So I encourage you, you know, to think uh, a little bit farther ahead, especially if you're doing this area, you know, uh, think that uh, GPT-3 will solve a lot of the underlying, um, you know, syn synonymy problems just with, with the fact that you have enough data, that the uh, retrieval methods are basically winning, right? Because you have enough data that uh, if somebody somewhere said it in some document that somehow got picked up by GPT-4, you know, you would have gotten the answer uh, straight off the bat, right? So what you're looking for are problems that haven't been solved or couldn't be solved by retrieval methods with big data, right? You stretch the big data out and say, Pretend any, you know, we have all the, I don't know, 7 billion monkeys or people, whatever you want to subscribe to in the world, creating and generating documents. What, uh, you know, uh, algorithm wouldn't be able to use all that data to answer a few shot or uh, zero shot methods. Okay, um, with that, since we don't have any uh, questions uh, besides Chung's questions for Cheng Lei, uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, Cheng Lei. And then uh, we'll move to our last presenter for the day, and that is going to be uh, uh, Shinza. Yes. Yep. So, Shinza, when you are ready, you can share screen. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm Shinza. So I'm a I'm an undergrad from in US, and so this paper is a uh, newly submitted uh, paper in May to ACM uh, 20, ACL 2020. So it, it's talking about logic guided data augmentation and regularization for constant functions. So first of all, uh, first of all, uh, this, this paper talks about a particular kind of question. Uh, there is a comparison type questions. So it's not discussing any other kind of QA. Uh, so comparison type questions, they ask about relationships between the properties of entities. Uh, so these relationships it can be uh, you know, cause, cause effect normally, and it can involve qualitative reasoning like you know, better or worse, or quantitative reasoning like you know, more or less. Uh, I think we are very familiar with comparison type questions. And the current state of the art uh, models used to predict the answer of comparison type questions are beta based models, as uh, I think uh, Gaoshuang has discussed about this before uh, in the first paper. Uh, but however, the author has observed that using the current state, state of the art model, there are two major problems uh, other than accuracy. So these two problems are symmetric inconsistency and uh, transitive inconsistency. Uh, I'll use some vivid example to uh, illustrate what are symmetric inconsistency and transitive inconsistencies. So on the right hand side, you can see, uh, you, you can see is the original example given by the author, but I came up with another example. So let's say a question asks, if Donald Trump has a lower support rate compared to Joe Biden, then the chance that Donald Trump wins the election is the answer space is more likely or less likely. And the answer predicted is less likely. So, and another question is uh, if Donald Trump has a higher support rate compared to Joe Biden, then the chance that uh, Donald Trump wins the election is the answer space also is the answer space is also more likely and less likely. And let's say the predicted result is less likely. So in this case, uh, without looking at the without looking at the uh, cause effect of the second question itself, if you simply compare these two questions, what you can see is that uh, the two questions are opposite to each other. So, using the same prediction, uh, we would normally expect the answer to be opposite to each other as well within our answer space. So that's why this is a symmetric inconsistency. 
uh, using the same uh, a similar example to illustrate transitive inconsistency. So in this case, let's say a question if Donald Trump has a lower support rate than Joe Biden, and the chance that Donald Trump wins the election compared to Joe Biden is uh, the predicted result is less likely. And the question two, if Joe Biden has a lower re support rate than Kanye West, I mean, this is, uh, this is my, I made it up myself. Kanye West will not be able to uh, win the election, of course. Uh, it, so the chance that Joe Biden wins the election compared to Kanye West is, uh, the predicted result is less likely. And the third question uh, is a, uh, it's like a combination of the first two. If Joe Biden has a, uh, if Donald Trump has a lower support rate than Joe Biden, and Joe Biden has a lower support rate than Kanye West, what's the chance that Donald Trump wins the election compared to Kanye West? If the predicted result, let's say, is more likely, and again, without considering the cause effect of the last question itself, what we can see that the the last question is actually a combination of the first two questions, and uh with a very simple logic that we have learned before that is when if a is smaller than b b is smaller than c then a has to be smaller than c then we, we can observe here a transitive inconsistency because this less likely and less likely this one it has to be more uh, less likely as well so there is transitive inconsistency uh i, I think uh, you are now familiar with what what are uh, a uh, symmetric and transitive inconsistency here. Uh, so knowing this, we can form, uh, we can define the task that the author uh, is investigating here. That is to produce globally consistent and accurate predictions for comparison type questions. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, they also throughout the paper she only uh, focuses on consistent instead of accurate. But if you consider, let's say, a previous two questions are already accurate, if you, you, you are able to make the prediction result more consistent, then on the other hand, you are also kind of make it accurate. Um, he also has uh, proposed uh, two different approaches, that is data augmentation and training regularization. So we can uh, look at them uh, one by one. Uh, for data augmentation, first uh, we need to formally define uh, formally define uh, consistency, uh, symmetric consistency, and transitive consistency. Uh, as uh, we have given two examples before, and in this case, the definition is that given a set of uh, QPA, I think it stands for a question, premise, and answer. Uh, it's implying Q symmetric, P, and A symmetric as a set. And in this case, given the same premise, if Q and Q symmetric are antonyms of each other, then A and A symmetric are opposites in A. A is the answer space. So this is the definition of consistent, uh, symmetric consistency. Um, and then they also has also formally defined transitive consistency. That is, given two uh, question sets, Q1, P, and A1, uh, Q2, P, and A2. Uh, so it's able to, it should be able to imply Q trans, P, and A trans. And do note here that it also uses a set of cause effect to define the questions. So Q1, oh, sorry, it's clicking. Uh, Q1 is having a cause effect of, uh, is having a cause of C1, and it results in an effect of E1. Q2 is having a cause of C2 and results in an effect of E2. In this case, being able to make a, a conjunction of these two sets, uh, these two sets have to fulfill the requirement that C2 equals to E1. That is the, the cause of the second question has to be the same to the effect of the first question. That's the, uh, that's the uh, requirement for them to be able to be con conjuncted and together from the tra transitive question. Uh, and then the author uh, has uh, explained the steps that she adopted to augment sy symmetric examples 
physically to generate more uh, symmetric uh, examples uh, training data sets. So first of all, she has uh, selected top frequent adjectives or verbs with polarity from the training corpora. Uh, you, you, you may wonder what's uh, adjectives or verbs with polarity. So it's basically, um, you know, adjectives like bigger, uh, earlier, or smaller, better, uh, or best. Uh, and verbs with polarity are words that are like increase, decrease, reduce. So she selected uh, around, oh, she selected 500 verbs and 50 verb phrases and 500 adjectives from the training corpora. And some uh, expert annotators write antonyms for each of the frequent words and they form a dictionary D. So to know that here in dictionary D, it is basically a dictionary of pairs and each pair is a pair of antonyms. So let's increase to decrease, bigger to smaller. So these are humanly annotated. So uh, the second step is that uh, she has also generated some templates. So one example of template is which star is or which star is not. So, so you, you can consider this as something like uh, which person is richer, uh, Bill Gates or Jake Ma. Uh, and the opposite question is which person is not richer, Bill Gates or Jack Ma. So you can see these are opposites. Uh, but uh, very unfortunately, she did not provide any other example of the templates. And she did not really mention how did she obtain these templates uh, in her paper. So I, I actually uh, emailed her regarding this question and some other questions, uh, but I haven't received her reply yet. Um, if I receive any reply, I think I will post in the group for updates. And uh, but uh, I take a guess here that uh, because maybe these templates are also uh, generated by some uh, experts or linguistics. Because I think uh, for English grammar, it shouldn't there shouldn't be too many of them uh, using uh, you know the which, when, what, uh, why. So uh, this should be uh, feasible to generate by human. And, and then now we have uh, together the dictionary D and the templates. So what they also do is that for each question, if the question includes any word in D or it matches the template. So uh, it, she will replace the word with the antonyms in D or and add or remove negation words. So this is basically, you know, replacing bigger with smaller or, or add removed negation words is like, she converts which is to which is not and which is not to which is. Um, and the last step is to relabel the answer A to the opposites in the answer space. So A and A star are opposites. Uh, but one thing to note here is that uh, there is a special situation if the question contains, you know, it, it contains both a word in the dictionary D and they also match the template. That means that these two steps are done together. Uh, it, it's kind of like a double negation because it, it's both replacing words with antonyms and change a negation word. In this case, it, it's kind of negating the meaning to, to its original meaning back. And so in this case, it, uh, she's not gonna change the, relabel the answer to its opposites. Instead, she's gonna maintain the original answer. And then next, uh, the next step for augmenting transitive examples. Uh, so for a pair of two cause effect questions, uh, X1 and X2. Uh, so if uh, this has to be uh, done using the same uh, logic as I discussed in the definition of uh, transitive consistency. So the question one has to contain a set of cause effect relationship of C1 and E1 and question two consists of cause effect relationship of C2 E2 and uh, E1 equals to C2 as we have discussed before. Uh, I wouldn't spend much more time on this and 
the, the idea is that if uh, if one is a positive causal relationship, then a new example x transition will be uh, x transition will be generated. Uh, there's a uh, q three p and uh, a two. So this a two here it means that it, it's actually this should be a actually this should be uh, a trans. So it's a new this I think this is a typo here. This should be a trans. So the uh, so in in this case the answer relabeling is uh, is done in this method using this method. Um, so if uh, a one indicates a positive correlation like uh, more, then the a star should follow a two. But if a one indicates a, a negative correlation, then the a star follow uh, is the opposite for a two. But actually, I think that this uh, this method of uh, answer relabeling is not perfectly correct because there are, there are some 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 possible uh, some possible uh, examples that do not satisfy this result. For instance, the example that I came up with with the uh, for the president election. So if the first two questions are less likely and less likely, the final result should also be less likely. But in this case, uh, A1, so A1 is less likely, it's indicating a negative correlation, but A star is actually the same as A2. So I, I think there's some problem with her transitive uh, relabeling. Uh, but uh, let's continue with the, training regularization so this is the second part the training regularization is basically redefining the loss function the original loss function is simply a task loss so it's indicated by this term l task uh, x x is a set of question premise and answer so she redefines the loss function by adding up a, an additional term that is a consistency loss so consistency loss has to be carried out using the original set and the augmented set generated as described in previous steps. A consistency loss is uh, calculated by adding two terms that is lambda's metric uh, loss metric and lambda transitive loss transitive. So, so it's basically uh, adding up the loss of these two kinds of, uh, these two kinds of inconsistencies. Uh, so let's look at let's look at uh, I think more closely into the how to calculate these loss functions. The loss of uh, the loss of uh, symmetric inconsistency is calculated by taking the log difference of the probability of getting a particular answer from the set of question and premise, as shown here, and the uh, the loss of Transitive inconsistency is get uh, similarly is adding up the log probability of getting the uh, answer for question one, question two, and dividing by the log probability of getting the answer of transitive uh, the transitive answer. So, actually, what I observed here is that uh. It, I think the transitive loss, it, it tends to have a greater value than a uh, symmetric loss because it's, you know, it's adding two terms and it's only dividing by one. So at first I saw that probably it, it should be like, for instance, a multiplier two here to make it, to make the two loss function more balanced. Uh, but the, the author has uh, said that she adopted a, a kneading a kneading algorithm in order to generate the lambda here for a lambda sim and lambda trans. So the annealing function, I think you all should be very familiar with it, is basically uh, it's in initialized the lambdas as zero and uh, it's getting from, you know, as time goes by, it's getting from more random to more greedy. And, and then I, I guess this uh, annealing algorithm will make the, uh, will make the weighting scaler in, in a way such that 
is balancing the symmetric and transitive loss. Uh, that's why I guess. And uh, and also an additional step is that after she generate, uh, she gen oh yes, she generate the after she generate the test cases, she is making a sample of the test cases, uh, to to different skills, and this will be discussed later in the experiments. Uh, so as we can see, this is the experiments. Uh, I think you don't need to really look at all the information within this uh, very complicated table, but uh, what uh, I want to focus here is these three data sets. So what are the differences between them? Uh, I mean, differences among them. Uh, the first one is uh, W1 QA stands for uh, what if question answering. And the second one is Quabrel, and the third one is Hopper QA. Uh, as you can see, they they focus on different reasoning format. Uh, w one QA focuses on causal reasoning classification, and Quabrel is more like a uh, qualitative reasoning. And for Hopper QA, is also a uh, is also a um, multi choice, but the difference is that Hopper QA, QA actually it provides no answer space. So the answer space is uh, extra extracted by module from the question itself, which tends, uh, which can be inaccurate. Uh, so they also, uh, they also actually has done very few uh, modification on the models used. So she's also used a Roberta based model for W1QA, uh, WIQA, uh, she used a classification based model. And for Quabrel, she used a multiple choice model. And for Hopper QA, she used a spam based model. But uh, I think these are already recorded in some of the previous papers. So I think there's no revolution here. And uh, she randomly sampled some of the augmented data. And for these three data sets, they are uh, 24,800 and uh, newly created examples, respectively. Uh, and then let's look at the performance of uh, of the new methods compared to the state of the art method on these three different data sets. Uh, in this case, the also sampled the each for each for each uh, corpus, the also samples the training data set to different skills, 20%, 40%, and 100% in order to test uh, the performance of her method on the limited data. And what we can observe here is that if we compare horizontally, uh, there's a increasing F1 score for both data augmentation and data augmentation plus her uh, training regularization. Uh, you can see here is a 1% increase and here's a 5% increase. Well, here there's a, a, around a 3% increase. So in general, there's a one to 5% increase for, the, for all data sets. And another thing is that uh, for limited data, there seems there is, uh, let's say there's 20% of the training data. For limited testing data, the performance increase seems to be uh, it's, there seems to be more increase in general if the test case is very limited. And one additional criteria is the violation of consistency metric uh, V. So this metric is, uh, is basically uh, trivially uh, calculated from the percentage of the examples. And as we can see this, uh, uh, this uh, violation rate has been dropped very significantly, especially for Hopper QA, which drops from 65% to 6%. Uh, so it, it seems that Hopper QA tends to, tends to introduce a lot of violation and inconsistencies. And this, and this will be analyzed in, uh, in, future, in the next step. So the author has also uh, done a qualitative analysis. So in this qualitative analysis, uh, it includes a WIQA data set and the Hopper data set. Uh, you can see that this is the correct answer. And these are the answers generated uh, for 
uh, the state of the art, the data augmentation and data augmentation together with uh, regularization. Uh, you can see that uh, for uh, W1QA, so data augmentation together with regularization, it reduces the confusion between the opposite choices. And it, it assigns uh, larger probabilities uh, to the ground truth labels for the questions. Uh, so basically in this case, uh, it's able to predict if for the symmetric case and the transitive case correctly. Uh, in this case, without regularization, is predicting the symmetric case wrongly, and it's also wrong for state of the art model. In addition, for for models, uh, for for the questions, uh, ground truth questions is is having a higher confidence for the its prediction, uh, and also for the uh, transitive. Uh, for the uh, asymmetric case, for the Hopper QA, the Roberta seems uh, it seems that the, the current state of the R model is unable to uh, to find out the difference uh, when when the question is becoming symmetric, as we seen here is having a sixty five percent of the violation rate. Uh, but data the data augmentation is able to identify, uh, it's able to predict the correct answer when the question is symmetric. So the one, one guess from the author is that she thinks that the current stuff, state of the art baseline models ex exploits some statistical pattern or there are some data set bias presented in the questions. So it, it, it's not, really focusing on a lot of the you know the negation words or expression of the question itself however the data augmentation it reduces the model's tendency to exploit these uh, spurious statistical pattern uh, so in conclusion we can uh, conclude that first of all this paper introduced a logical a uh, logic guided data augmentation and consistency based regularization framework uh, as we discussed before and this helps to increase the accuracy and the uh, consistency compared to state of the art models uh, across three different qa data sets and lastly uh, the models are able to learn more effectively especially when the training data is limited uh, so I think that concludes my presentation here. Okay, so uh, we're a little bit over time. It's about 3.06, but uh, maybe we can pause for a couple uh, minutes here and just ask whether there are any questions to uh, Shinza. And uh, of course we should thank our presenters. So let's thank uh, Shinza first for presenting this uh, new work. So I think uh, comparative question answering is a really interesting uh, thing that uh, people are looking at. We, we see this all the time in, in, in um, recommendation system where you want to, uh, you know, compare two different products together or things of this sort. And, uh, you know, there, there are certain semantics which uh, this paper is trying to pick up on. So uh, remember when we had uh, Cheng Lei's presentation just uh, about 20 minutes ago and I ended up in, uh, in saying, you know, what what could uh, GPT-4 not do that, uh, that uh, you could try to look at? And this is one of them, right? So um, definitely having a better uh, language representation um, would allow us to do uh, this work nicely. Okay. However, this is sort of um, not quite hitting the nail uh, uh, to me because, uh, again, we're, we're trying to find a, a logical way of um, uh, fixing problems with uh, uh, BERT and other language models uh, to handle uh, uh, problems that are apparently not doable with language models, right? And then we're trying to regularize or do something with it so that we can uh, still get logical 
uh, entailment out of the system, right? By using the rise of construct concussions. Uh, so those of you who are interested in working on pre-training language models, you can think, okay, well, I have statistics, uh, but can I introduce some of this um, logic, this uh, symbolic logic directly into um, the language model, okay? Or, or find a, a surrogate for that so that um, these problems don't have to be uh, treated uh, statistically, they can be treated symbolically so that they can be um, provably correct, right? I mean, whatever we're doing right now is not going to prove anything, right? It's just going to make um, the right answers come out statistically higher uh, on average because of the types of uh, regularization or the types of synthetic gen data generation that we're doing, right? But if you talk to you know people in AI who believe in strong AI, they're saying you're doing the wrong thing. You're not actually solving the problem. You're, you're treating the symptom, right? Uh, the underlying problem of the knowledge representation is not going to be solved with a language model. Okay, so uh, any comments on uh, Shinza's paper? So I was intentionally trying to run into interference while you guys think about questions. Actually, I uh, was wondering, but it's not really related to paper, it's related to what you just said, but I was wondering if there is any um, existing work, uh, I would be interested in, in reading it, that would uh, link the uh, modern statistical NLP with uh, Montague grammars with uh, Kripke semantics, because um, this used to be the approach uh, 50 years ago, and it was pretty powerful, but limited in its uh, use to whatever grammar it can handle, but uh, maybe there has been something studying how to uh, bias the models using such uh, constructs somehow, or um, to make use of those in the deep models. I'm not sure. So uh, it's just a question I'd like uh, to check. Okay, thanks, Alex, for that. Uh, I have some answers to that, but perhaps I'll, I'll let uh, people on the floor, you know, any of us uh, want to weigh in on this 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 issue that Alex brought up about uh, knowledge representation, uh, going back to uh, more elegant, more symbolic methods of parsing and understanding. Okay, I think uh, if you look at uh, works on abstract meaning representation, AMR, there are a number of people going back to uh, standard logical forms and, and trying to use these templates as a way of uh, inducing knowledge uh, from corpora and then using that to, to frame inference around. Um, even Chris Manning himself uh, for a while, um, about a decade ago, was working on this idea of what he called natural logic. It's the idea of using uh, statistical based systems, but uh, also having a theorem proving based uh, inference module uh, directly in a natural language system that could uh, answer questions like this without the help of some gigantic uh, language model, right? So the idea is, uh, again, just like what humans do uh, for the most part when we, we use our, what we call system two, our, our, our logical or and that, that is something that um, we haven't uh, gotten uh, all the way in uh, or, or much at all at this point. So again, like I said last uh, week, you know, uh, when we first came to statistical NLP and people were thinking, okay, what more can we do with data? And then, as I said, Fred Jalanek said um, in his uh, speech recognition project, the every time I fire a linguist, the better the performance of the system uh, improves, right? Uh, we're still sort of in that age where we, we haven't gotten to the point where we can exhaust uh, the amount of data that's out there that we can ingest and, and get some gains with it. But uh, like I said, these are all sort of uh, treating the symptom without addressing the issue at hand. I mean, even if GPT-4 uh, gets uh, very good results and can answer everything, how do we guarantee that it's actually doing what we want it to do? Because we don't have any fundamental basis. It's just a bunch of statistics that lead us to an answer, right? We don't have any trust in uh, being able to um, understand why it's done that. 
Yeah, so I think that is a, another frontier that uh, a lot of people are interested in, especially with bias and fairness. You know, we want to guarantee a certain level of performance now that NLP has gotten um, the trashiness uh, of its response out of the way. I mean, uh, a decade ago, you wouldn't trust um, um, a transcription system at all. And now we are using Siri and, and, and Hey Google or, or Alexa to do a lot of work. Okay, uh, so you've spent another two hours and 15 minutes wasting uh, your time with our reading group. So I encourage you to waste more time uh, in uh, next week. So uh, come back for week eight, where we cover uh, the second half of data augmentation for um, uh, machine reading comprehension. Uh, are there any further questions that uh, are from the floor? Anything burning that you'd like to get off your chest? Okay, perhaps I'm not pausing long enough. This is a, a problem that we have in, um, in uh, professors not uh, taking enough time to get questions, but let us go ahead and uh, thank all of our presenters today. You did a very good job. Okay, and uh, so we'll see you all in two weeks time. Uh, sorry, next week. Um, those uh, from week seven, you need to finish up your scribing duties. I know the scribes have been working very hard uh, over the last two hours. And those in week recess, you need to make the pull request to, to finish off um, the uh, web page updates. And again, all of you who are external guests or uh, CS6101 uh, first year PhD students, you need to put up your abstracts if you haven't already. I will check those off and give you some grades, well, not grades, uh, feedback on uh, the, the project ideas that you have over the next week or so. Okay, thank you very much. Take care everyone, see you next time.